A big thank you to Richard Ward for his take on the story of Pentecost from the book of Acts. Richard was one of my preaching professors in seminary at the Isle of School of Theology. He actually preached at my ordination back in the day. He's an old friend who offered to tell the ancient story of spirit in a way that only he can do and make the video available to anyone who wanted to use it in worship today. It's just another example of the ways that people are opening their hearts and sharing their gifts, offering what we can of ourselves that might be helpful to another. I really appreciated Richard's gift of inspiration because I will be honest with you, I didn't have much of my own. If you're clergy, it's kind of scary to feel uninspired about Pentecost. But that's the space in which I found myself this week. Like a lot of pastors who have bravely jumped into the world of online worship, I'm finding it to be very challenging. It's very different to plan and lead worship online than it is face-to-face. -face. Back in the old days, you remember the old days, we would gather here in this sanctuary. Hugs and handshakes and warm greetings before worship. There would be new people every week, and our official greeter, Rhonda, would be on top of it. We would look into their eyes when we welcomed them. In the sermon, I would read your faces as I spoke. I'd notice your body language and cue off the energy in the room, adjusting what I said depending on what I observed in all of you, getting nervous if somebody stormed out. No, that never happened. Surprisingly, that never happened. But my point is that preaching is, at its essence, an interactive experience. Online, it's just me and the camera. Yes, our wonderful tech team is here too. And gosh, I am so happy that you are. But they're busy, y'all. They got stuff to do to make sure that this all happens. Just as you miss being here, I miss you being here. From the standpoint of planning, what I so hope is a meaningful worship experience. I feel much of the time that I'm just sort of guessing guessing at what to say or do, hoping that it resonates with you, but not really having any sense of if it lands or not. And this week is Pentecost. That's a big Sunday in the life of the church. For lots of preachers, at least, me included, it is right up there with the big two, Christmas and Easter. Pentecost is inspiration itself the coming of spirit, the birth of the church, fire and wind, chaos, and lots of languages. Worship planners dream up, dream up all sorts of gimmicks for Pentecost, and I love every single one. Everybody wear red, that's a given, of course. A cake to celebrate the birthday of the church. Red velvet, of course. A champagne toast in worship, why not? An interactive script with parts for the congregation and readers and different languages. Red ribbons passed out at the door to be waved on cue. A fan blowing red streamers. In years past, we had every one of those things, mind you, and they were fantastic. And then Pentecost 2020 rolls around. I'm still pastoring a church, but it feels more like I'm running a multimedia company. I so want a big bang for Pentecost. But you know what? I am fresh out of ideas. This is what you get, because this is all I've got. Something else, I trust that it's enough. I know it's enough. Actually, maybe being uninspired 
is perfect for Pentecost in a pandemic. The ancient myth of Pentecost arose as the earliest Jesus followers were coming together after his crucifixion. They were making sense of the tragic loss of their teacher. Somehow they found the resources within themselves to keep going and to find a new story. They found stories that helped them trust that Jesus was still with them, empowering them with spirit and with heart. They got busy and organized. They brought Jesus back to life. They brought Jesus back to life by giving him a new body, a movement, the church, the body of Christ. We know more about how things turned out than they did, at least up to now. And so it all sort of makes sense to us. The story seems even a bit quaint. To them, those were days of confusion and cacophony and chaos and fear. People were acting crazy and doing all sorts of strange things. Were they drunk? What was happening? Historians like Phyllis Tickle note that there have been these spectacular moments of great disruption and turmoil in the history of the church. About every 500 years or so, she writes, there's a self-correction that happens in the church. Like, say, the Reformation. There's a self-correction for you. She compares it to a great rummage sale, when we slough off what's no longer needed, making space for the church that needs to be. That's what we're doing right now. It's not easy, but we are becoming the church that we need to be right now, not 50 years ago, not even 10 years ago, but today, right now. We are in the midst of a turning like that. It was happening before a global pandemic hit. It has now been accelerated. Public theologians recognize this and are coming up with all these rich images to describe this moment. A great unveiling, an upheaval in which the church is being turned inside out. What is church when our buildings are closed, when our rituals are interrupted, when the old ways of doing things no longer work? If the result of church being turned inside out is that we take church to the streets and realize that church never was about a building, would it have been worth it? Showing love, doing justice, walking humbly are actions that can't be expressed merely by sitting in a pew for an hour on Sundays. When we are able to gather again in person, and we will someday, it will be different. We will be different. I mean, we enjoyed church before. Most of us, most of the time. If we didn't, we wouldn't have come. But maybe we'll have a different appreciation for the value of being together. Some of us have gone through very difficult experiences while we have been separated. Maybe we're realizing in a new way how essential this community is for our spiritual and emotional awakening. Together, we're writing a new story of what it means to be church. It's not easy. It's scary and uncertain and confusing. We're grieving what we've lost, at least what we've lost for now. But even though we are physically distanced, our connection, our community, 
is real. It has never been more real. We can continue to draw strength from one another, to keep walking with each other on this journey, one step at a time, with peace and with purpose. Even in our uninspired moments, we can lean on each other and draw strength. That sweet, sweet spirit is with us still. That sweet spirit is us.